Hi, my name is Jim Rapon with Cobalt Banker Danforth, and this is Seattle Real Estate Chat. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's May, what is it, 19th, and 19th. Uh, I'm here with uh, Rhonda. Rhonda, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Jim. I'm Rhonda Porter. I'm a licensed loan officer with Mortgage Master Service Corporation. I'm also author of the blog, The Mortgage Porter. And for those of you who are live, I'm sorry we got started a few minutes late. We had a little bit of technical difficulties where the back end that we're using has gone through some changes and uh, it takes us a little while to kind of get into the right path and get every, all of the settings working just right. Anyway, so today's uh, topic of discussion is the new uh, rental registration and inspection ordinance for the city of Seattle. And it's been uh, around for a little while. It's been about a year year and a half uh, since the Seattle City Council uh, passed this ordinance and it's uh, and it's been starting to in effect they're they're doing it in, in rolling numbers based on the size of a number of units that uh, we're talking about so you know if it's a hundred or two hundred or more those were the first to be implemented and, and down now we're down to the one to five unit uh, uh, owners and, and property managers, single onesie twosies, if you will, uh, that are finally being implemented between now and the end of 2016. Um, before we get too far down the road here, I just want to say uh, a little disclosure here for both Ron and myself. Neither of us are attorneys. Neither of us are in a position to give any kind of legal advice. Uh, and if any of the things we're discussing today uh, raise concerns or issues or uh, have questions about any of that kind of stuff, you should uh, uh, either contact the city, uh, the Department of Planning, their, this uh, rental ordinance department, or an attorney uh, and, and get clarification. And please don't lean on any of the things that we're saying today as factual or, or advice. Uh, again, we're just citizens like you are and, and looking to share and discuss what are, are new things in our market. So, um, this affects everybody, really, who is either a landlord or a tenant uh, to some degree. Um, Want to hear end of anybody who's a, a tenant or a landlord that's dealing with this? Um, I don't yet, but I do. Well, I do know that we have a uh, we're, we're accidental landlords, my husband and I. So, um, so we have a home in um, West yeah, we meant to sell after we bought our other home, and um, and then the real estate crisis happened when it did, and you know we, we didn't sell in time, and and we've had um, somebody renting it ever since, and and uh, anyhow, so we um, I remember hearing like about it a few years ago, like when this was starting to come around, and uh, recently received a letter stating that. Um, it's you know what, what the time frames are for registering a property, and honestly, I didn't think back when it came out, um, or when I first heard the buzz about it, um, I didn't realize they were going to go down to single family owners, landlords, you know, people that just have one home. So I thought they were going after more people that were doing this as a business professionally. So I was kind of surprised by it. Yeah, um, I think that that was true for a lot of. Uh, individual property owners. Um, in my case, uh, our company has a property management division called Banker Danforth, and uh, they deal with mostly multiple units. Uh, but I'm, I guess it's certified through them. I've taken the course and I have property management experience, and I manage one property, one client, and it's a single family home. And I knew that it was coming, but I didn't realize it was coming this uh, at this stage. So uh, it's something I have to hop on as well. Um, the, um, there are lots of exemptions. They are not single family homes though. Uh, virtually anything that is government related, you know, uh, Seattle city housing, uh, authority, um, any type of government funded, uh, type of housing, the list I looked through just basically anything that was related to any kind of government housing, like uh, military housing or, uh, anything like that, uh, seems to be excluded. Um, Again, you'll want to double check, but that seems to be the case. Um, also, so any additional dwelling units or mother-in-law units, we call them, those are not included. Um, any kind of assisted living uh, homes. So there are, there's, a, there's a long list of, an ex of exclusions. So um, look through that if, you're, if you have any question and you're not sure, um, and, and we can put a link to those definitions. Um, I also have an FAQ, and if you're live, I'll go ahead and pop it in here if I can find it. Um, and if not, I'll just, I'll 
I'll send you a link because there's a link from the um, uh, what is it? Uh, the Department of Planning, the Rental Inspection Division. Mm -hmm. It's a new division because it's all new, um, and it's it's a PDF that gives sort of a, a one, two, three quick FAQ of a lot of the stuff that you might run into. Yeah, no, I don't see the the pop in here. Uh, Thought we had it set up, but we were scrambling this morning, so several things didn't make it. Um, at any rate, uh, it it will talk, you know, like what the fees are and so everything like that. Which we why don't we start out with that? Looks like the fees are to register are one hundred and seventy five dollars uh, for right. the first unit, and then two dollars for each additional unit. Um, but I don't know why that's pretty, you know, really really cheap. Someone's got two hundred units, expensive for someone who has one, but right. Um, but that's the way they've got it set up. And I guess it's partly because they intend to inspect each property uh, group, if you will, like if it's a an apartment building, that building will be inspected. How many units they'll inspect in that building? Mm, they have lots of uh, circumstances where they may randomly choose only one or 10 or all of them. Uh, so it, it, at least they have a minimum charge for that particular property. So uh, single family, I took that to mean that single family homes will probably be all checked. Uh, is that how you read it, Rhonda? I read it that way and that it's and to be expected to be checked um, once every 10 years at least. And then I believe the fee for that is you can use, you don't have to use a city inspector. You can use a private inspector and they, they'll use one of the city forms. But um, the city inspectors, I believe they're saying that price is going to start at $130. Right. For the um, inspection itself, uh, yeah. they have to. They, you, you, you have to use one of the certified inspectors. Though. Is that right? The, I believe the, so. Yeah, and they, they've got a process for inspectors to apply to that and get the certification for that and all of that. Uh, you know, there's some costs there too if you want to be an inspector and and have that kind of a certification. It doesn't sound that dissimilar from a home inspector for a purchase home. Uh, the, the kinds of things they'll be going through, although it it feels to me that the thresholds, even though they're very vague, are lower than right. what you would see. I mean, a, a home inspector, when you're purchasing a home, they go over everything and they're gonna tell you about, you know, every little crack tile, every little squeak in the floor that they can find, that they can uh, substantiate and explain to you. And especially if they see some safety violation or some structural mm -hmm. issue that could affect you. This is more of a, a tolerance of, habitability to a safe and whatever they determine appropriate level. Um, but it does seem to cover a lot of systems. It, it does. And that was one thing that was kind of interesting to me because like there were items in there like um, if the landlord provide, provides the refrigerator and they must make sure that the refrigerator is in working order, well, it makes me kind of wonder, well, how many landlords will just pull out the refrigerators and let that be a tenant issue? I mean, not that a landlord wouldn't take care of that issue anyhow, but um, there, um, it was kind of an interesting read to go over. The one thing too is that um, for the units that are um, single family units, like if you just have a one, a one person home or not one person home, but a, a single family dwelling, um, that Seattle is rolling out the due dates for those by um, zip code. Right, right. Uh, in terms of when they're going to require you to be registered and have it done. Um, and there's a, there's a link for that too on their site to see that. Um, I'm going to bring up the checklist here uh, that kind of goes over uh, the main things will be covered. And I think this is important, especially for landlords to know, but also for tenants to know that their mm -hmm. landlord needs to have these things checked. Um, just kind of run through them here. Uh, exterior, obviously, your roof needs to make sure it doesn't have any holes or is not leaking. Chimney, uh, they're going to check to make sure chimneys are, st are stable and not uh, not need repointing at the top and all that kind of stuff. Foundation uh, needs to not be crumbling or missing pieces. Um, decks and stairways, that's going to be a big one for a lot of people because mm -hmm. uh, you have homes where they have these, um, like, well, I should say apartment buildings where you have these exterior stairs that are out there. Uh, they're going to have to make sure all of those are, are, none of them are loose, none of them are decaying, and gosh, we all know how... Uh, things decay here. If it's wooden, it's it's when, not if it decays, right? So, right, um, right. 
uh, they're going to have to, landlords are going to have to be very careful about the, and that makes sense, but for safety reasons, that's probably a very critical one. Um, guardrails. Um, I remember in the property I managed, there was just a, a small interior uh, landing that had five steps going down and there was not a railing on it. So um, I immediately, before the tenant took occupancy, made sure we had a railing installed because I was worried someone could slip and break their neck. Uh, of course, mm -hmm. there'd be liability, but also worried that someone might get hurt. So um, yeah, that's the kind of thing they're going to have to be all over it. I think it's 30 inches here. Yeah, 30 inches or more grade. So that's going to be really like three or four steps at most. Um, right. Let's see. Windows and doors ha are cracked. Uh, and allowing weather or water to get inside. This is gonna be huge uh, because really they're going after um, weather stripping here. I mean, you're, you're gonna have to have pretty decent weather stripping. And we know that in Seattle, we have a number of older homes with wooden sash windows where they, rat, you know, when they rattle and all that air is coming and going, uh, not okay, I'm guessing. Uh, again, it's gonna be to the discretion of the uh, inspector, but I think they're trying to Make that pretty clear. Um, do you think this will um, impact the rental market, Jim? I mean, do you think it'll make some people not want to be landlords, or do you think that most people already pretty much keep their homes to this standard? You know, the regular, typical landlord. Uh, uh, yeah, good question because there's so there's such a wide range of landlords. I I, I kind of think that the financial incentive is still very strong enough to make them want to deal with it you know it's regulations they don't want to deal with uh but uh, you know they're just going to have to and uh i think it's probably going to make a lot of sense for them once they start doing it it's because it's really it's just maintenance really what they're saying right. is we'll protect no, their investment too exactly there's uh, yeah. no more slum lords is what they're kind of getting at um interior uh all the bathroom ventilation kitchen ventilation you have to have a fan if there's a stove um Walls and floors, obviously, this is back to moisture, can't be soft, spongy, or wet. Um, all of the joists and posts, leaning, decayed, or detached. Now, that may mean that they do a crawl under the crawl space, and if they find dry rot or, or wood rot, that that might have to be replaced, and that could be expensive. Uh, but that's the kind of thing we see all the time on a home for purchase. So right. um, let's see, what else? Emergency doors and windows. Uh, have to be accessible, not blocked, and meet height requirements. Now, this would have been a big deal uh, if we were talking about ADUs uh, because so many of them are in basements with low ceilings and small windows that are not to code at all and quite a fire hazard. But you know, I'm surprised they're not included. Yeah, you know, could have been a lobby. Uh, I don't know what the politics behind that was, but um, it may have been just logistically just getting people to register them, I mean, might have been, might have been tough too, because there's a lot of them out there that no one even know exist. Mm -hmm. um, room sizes, I thought this was an interesting. Anything that's less than seven feet as a, as a habitable room or 70 square feet in size. Now there's um, an exemption for, and I don't see it in here, but I read there's an exemption for all these new micro housing units that or like 150 feet or whatever they are. Okay. Those don't count and, and are not included in, I believe, the whole inspection process. Um, so again, kind of an interesting thing. Dirt floors, kind of obvious, but yeah. I gotta say, I have, as I show property all the time, all over the place, I can't tell you how many times I've come into a basement with a dirt floor and found, uh, sadly, a half a dozen or a dozen uh, immigrant workers living down there, so. Oh, wow. Yeah, uh, that's hopefully will go away. Heating systems, uh, heat sources have to be in working order. All the ventilation has to work. Temperature has to be 68 Fahrenheit or higher when, when for you know for heating. So that's kind of there's going to be some homes that you know lower quality homes that that may be an issue for. Uh, electrical standards, full electrical wiring, everything working. Um, and all habitability, obviously nothing of safety concerns. All bathrooms and hallways and stairways have to be well lit. Uh, plumbing and hot water have to be uh, set above 120 degrees. Uh, and let's see, obviously good sanitation, toilets and sinks and tubs and showers working. 
fully functional, uh, no leaky sinks. Uh, so you, if the landlord says, ah, it's a, just a leaky sink, sorry, they're going to have to fix that. So, um, so that's kind of, let's see, anything else here? I think I kind of quickly went over a lot of this stuff. Uh, refrigerators and freezers, any cabinets or appliances, all that kind of stuff has to work in the kitchen. Uh, faucets have to be able to turn on and off easily. Um, and then above and beyond that, the owner is obligated for uh, all the garbage and rubbish uh, receptacles. So all recycling uh, ability has to be there. You can't have it set up where there's, well, sorry, there's only room to put all your garbage in one place and you can't recycle. They have to have all that taken care of. Uh, if there's, they have to make sure there's no rodents or uh, ants or cockroaches. They have to make sure all the locks work. Uh, and they have to make sure you have the smoke detectors and uh, carbon monoxide detectors that are required by law. And that's around and outside of sleeping rooms and areas where people sleep. So that's kind of the, I think I got the, the that was a very quick, uh, you know, 30 mile above view of what it is. But I think that, that kind of gives um, an idea of what we're looking at here in terms of it's pretty detailed. It's pretty, pretty detailed. So um, I think you know you can check with the city to see when your landlord uh, was supposed to register. My guess is, the, is that they may have some sort of a uh, system for tenants to double check that it's been done and that they passed. Mm -hmm. um, but it, this is not a a mechanism for a complaint process. There's a whole Whatever was in place before that still is in effect. So you, you, this is not for tenants to make a complaint to their landlord about this. Right, right. Yeah, and so the website that they have for this is uh, <clears throat> seattle.gov forward slash R-R-I-O. See, ta-da, I don't know. <laughs> right, Re rental registration inspection ordinance. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, and uh, you know the penalties. I think are, I think they start out. If there's a grace period, they really want to make this an educational thing. So if the landlord's like, they, you know, they have the inspection and they come back and they say you have all of these violations, <clears throat> they're not immediately fined. They're they're told they have 30 days to get it fixed, and then I think they come back and reinspect. And even if it takes longer than 30 days, if they can. You know they're clearly showing they're in process and and it doesn't look like they're dragging their feet they're not it doesn't sound like they're anxious to find this because then it goes through another process once they start finding them it's going to be um my understanding is it's going to be 150 dollars uh per day uh I'm not sure if that's per unit or total mm -hmm. and then after 10 days it goes up to 500 dollars a day wow. so um, yeah so even even landlords that have 20 or 50 units, you know, you you add up $500 a day, 30 days. Uh, what's that? That's uh, th three. No, no, thirty, fifteen thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, fifteen thousand dollars for a month. Uh, that would add up as a, a substantial expense pretty quickly for a landlord. Um, if if they got nailed with this over a long period of time it's certainly worth paying attention to sure absolutely i mean uh, you know again no one likes regulations but on the other hand this is supposed to cure some real problems uh, back in 2009 i think what spurred this was back in 2009 there was a survey a national survey done in seattle it turned out um out of the i believe we had at that time about 145,000. Uh, you, rental units in the city. It's gone up a good bit since then. But um, of that, they found that 10% uh, did not meet the minimum requirements for habitability and safety and all that. And and I don't know what, what those were, those levels and how it was determined what was and what wasn't or all of that. Um, but that was, I think, the impetus to put this forward. So um, hmm. anyway, we're, uh, we're experiencing, continue to experience a a lot of rental growth as well as growth for sales for when we can find the inventory for the buyers who want to buy. Uh, but the rental um, multifamily market is expanding quite rapidly as people move into the area. So um, 
I think this probably will help protect everyone. So. Right, right. So um, I guess that's about it today. Again, my apologies that we uh, we didn't get going right on time and everything, but I think this is a, is a good one for a lot of people, uh, both renters and landlords, take a peek at. And like I said, we'll put links to the information on here uh, because there's a, there's a lot of a lot of di information to digest. Um, let's see. You, I'm hoping we can get. We've lately we've only been doing one of these every month or maybe two a month, uh, but a little bit inconsistent. I know also, Rhonda, you're getting ready to take off to Japan, right? Right, right. I'm going to go check out um, density in Japan with housing. <laughs> in yeah, Tokyo. yeah, yeah I'll, be, I'll be gone for a bit in June. Taking my my son is um, graduating from Seattle U, and so we're going to take a trip together. Um, just the two of us and check out Tokyo and Kyoto. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. that that'll be great. Uh, as you know, I lived over there for over 10 years and it's a wonderful country and a great country for a tourist. It's super safe, super interesting. Uh, you'll, you'll just have a great time. And I, you're gonna go be, be going down by, what was it? Uh, not uh, Hakodate or one of Hakani? the islands along the, uh, oh. on the Shinkansen? Uh, I don't think, um, I think we're gonna be staying on the mainland, but we're gonna be going to, um, uh, Hakone for Hakone. one night. Yeah. Yeah. For, for one night to stay in a real con. So yeah, that's, and that's down in a peninsula down there below, um, Mount Fuji as you go down past Kotimba, yeah. uh, beautiful coast, beautiful area. You'll have a great time. Yeah. So anyway, um, hopefully we'll be able to squeeze one in before that. When, when is that you're taking off? Oh, on the 13th of June. So we should be able to do get another yeah. one in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's let's try to do one more uh, okay. real estate chat before you take off, and then we'll do one again once as soon as you get back, shortly after. Okay. Um, so everybody, thanks again for tuning in, and uh, if you missed it, and, and we understand why because we started late. Hopefully, we we'll get a chance to see this replay. Uh, thanks so much, and everybody have a great day. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.